in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And it was good. Welcome to Untethered. What's happening, YouTube? Jake Johnson here, and this is Untethered. Boy, we got a show packed for you today. We're going to play some great music. We're going to do some more great music. We're going to do some not so good music and go back to some great music and then we're going to have a conversation to beat all conversations. So please do join in. If you have questions, ask them and I will answer them. Oh, it's nice to be here, man. I had a good weekend. I think I slept most of the weekend. But that's okay. Sleeping's good. What's up, Mr. Mercer? Good to see you. Hope you brought some friends, because we're going to get crazy tonight. I'm going to tune up, smoke this cigarette while I wait for folks to show up. I think we got a couple already. Let's see. Yeah, we got two already. We're getting there. What's happening? Good to see you. All right, got a couple coming in. As I was saying, we're gonna play some good music. We're gonna have some good conversation tonight. While I'm waiting on everybody else to show up, I'm going to go ahead and share this to Facebook. Tell everybody, hey, come on down. All right. There's, I got three of them. There's one. And here's three. You guys having a good time so far? Ready to get rocking and rolling? I've been thinking about it all weekend. There. We're all shared up, ready to go. You guys like to hear any particular thing? Holler it out and I'll play it for you. What would you like to hear, Mr. Mercer?
Anything in particular? Any song you haven't heard in a while? I'm playing in drop D today for those of you that don't recognize. That's where I tune my E string down to a low D so it's got that really good funky sound. Yeehaw! It's Manic Monday and I'm going manic this afternoon. You want to hear one of my songs right off the bat, huh? Okay. Anyone in particular or just something you hadn't heard before? I can accommodate. Jake Johnson original for you. <clears throat> Where's the old man at, Rachel? Don't see him in here yet. Still missing a few people. Where's everybody at today? I'm going to be waxing intellectual later, and I can't do that to nobody.
showing off the chromosome. All right, here's a song I wrote when I was 14 years old. Nope, I was 17 years old, sorry. Hey, Gray Sky Troll, what's happening? Good to see you. was 17 when I wrote that song. I hadn't had kids yet, so I didn't know what the hell I was talking about, but it just came out and it sounded right, so if you enjoyed it, there you go. There's the oldest one I got. Mm. Third oldest one I got. You're crashing soon. You had a hard day. I'm sorry to hear that, man. Well, hang in there with me for an hour, and then you can go to bed and feel like you've done something. <laughs> Folks, be sure to like, subscribe, and share. And if you feel compelled to help the guy out, paypal.me slash Jake Johnson Band or one of the links in the description below would be much appreciated. And if not, sit back and enjoy the ride because we're going for it. Here's a song I wrote in college with a girlfriend of mine. Where's T-Bone at? I hadn't seen her in a couple of shows. Anybody know her, tell her I'm asking about her. Another 
another Saturday morning She wakes me up at dawn She moves to fill my coffee cup But in a minute I'll be gone she was beautiful, but those words are nothing new. Cause lately I've been playing a game, treating her just like a fool. If heartaches were pennies, she'd be a millionaire. She laughed and cried and called me names, but I didn't. Decided that this is it. Last time I do it wrong. Just one last weekend rendezvous, but then I'm coming home. But if she knows she's pulling me, she's never heard my song before, but she. She knows the taste of wine And if she knows she's fooling me this time well, I guess I put her to it Yeah, I finally put her down but goody man y'all got me in all kinds of wanting to play my own stuff kind of moods today kind of hoarse though I'm sorry about my voice it's crackling on me for some reason That's all right. You guys have a song you'd like to hear? Gray Sky, you want to hear something? Let's see here.
Irish Lou. One of my good buddies in Georgia. What we got going on? Play some 90s country or 80s country. Cross your heart to one of your favorites. That's some fine playing right there. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Hmm. Let's see if I can pull off a song I don't actually know. You already know I can, so... I didn't see the movie, so maybe I can do it. Love is unconditional. I knew it from the start. See it in your eyes. I can feel it in your heart. Share the love and laughter that a lifetime will allow. I cross my heart and promise to give all I've got to give to make all your dreams come true. In all the world, you'll never find. best I can do for you. <laughs> Let's see. Well, you say you were wrong to ever leave me alone. So you're sorry you lost on And you said you'd be happy if you could just come back home. Here's a quarter. Bye. 
rocking chair Geritol Medicare My body is old but it ain't impaired I don't need your rocking chair My body ain't ready for the graveyard yet Blame it all on my roots I showed up in boots Growing your black tie affair Last one to know Last one to show I was the last one You thought you'd see there and I saw the surprise The fear in his eyes When I stole his thing
country. Love it. 
Okay, that's enough of that craziness.
It's amazing how you can speak right to my heart Without saying a word You can light up the dark Oh, Mr. Webster can never define What's being said between your heart and Touch of your hand says you'll catch me if ever I fall. You say it best. You say nothing at all. some more ideas. I'm running thin there. Hmm. I hadn't played these 90s songs, you know, since the 90s.
All right. Here's a song I wrote. the devil outside my window coldest night in April is in the wind every drop I see falling I hear your voice calling Lord it tears my whole Let's go out. Outside my window A little Hank Senior for you. I wish I knew all the words of that song. Maybe one day I'll learn it. I did know it, but I forgot it. As with most things, in one ear and right out the other. I've come to the conclusion that one can only hold so much crap in one's brain before it turns to mayonnaise. But, how about something like this?
keep a close watch on this heart of mine. I keep my eyes wide open all the time. I keep my hands out for the ties that bind. Because Because you are
on this heart of mine. All right, how about that? Okay. Let's get serious. Uh, why? Why do I want to get involved in a bunch of drama, telling a bunch of stories about history and science? Why me? Well, there's several reasons for that. One of the biggest ones being that I feel led to do so. Now, since I was a little bitty boy, probably about six years old, I wanted to be a preacher, but I had this really weird feeling about being a preacher because I always felt like it was a scam, you know, that people were doing it to get rich and to get power, and I did not want to be one of those people. So what I said was, if the Lord wants me to be a preacher, then nothing on earth can stop it from happening. If he'll open all the doors that allow me to be and close all the doors that allow me to go elsewhere, then I will dedicate my life and be a preacher for the rest of it. Well, that never happened, so I never became a preacher, and that's fine. Clearly, that's not my job. But that didn't stop me from learning the uh, tricks of the trade and the crux of the crew. So I spent a great deal of time with my nose in the book, probably about 15 years studying the Bible and learning Greek and Aramaic and different languages like that and how to translate them and, you know, going way back and following leads here and there. Uh, so much so that I've got what's the equivalent of a PhD on the subject. And before we go any further on that, no, you cannot see it. And no, you don't need to call me doctor. Why? Because I don't want you to. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what a piece of paper says. It doesn't matter how much I went to school or what I learned. What matters is, is the information am I giving you, is it correct? Okay, that leads to the next, the next reason. Because while there are people out there who touch on subjects similar to what I'm talking about, there is no one in this day and age who is pulling it all together in a cohesive, coherent thought that everybody can understand and rely on. A non-biased, uh, non-tricked out version of the truth that doesn't involve somebody making a lot of money off of you for no reason. Uh, that's not what I'm about. That's not what I want to do. Third reason is, is I ain't going to be here very much longer and I got two kids that need guidance. So I want to have a thing on the record that they can refer to for the rest of their life and your kids too for that matter and see this is, this is the, the thing that's really going on. This is something I can count on. So, with a great deal of dismay and a lot of thought, I decided to write a book. Then I realized that if I tried to write down the volume of stuff that is involved in this subject, that the paper would just catch on fire and I'd never get anywhere. So the next thing was, well, let's do a podcast about it. Well, I have the technology, I have the means, and I have the motive and operandus, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this for the last half of my podcast. I'm going to spew some knowledge at you. First half, I'll play music. Anything else you want me to do? Second half, first half is for you. Second half is for me. If we can agree on that, we'll be doing good. Uh, this is a big topic. There is absolutely no way that I could cover it in one or two podcasts or even a year worth of podcasts. So the best way to go about it is to take it one topic at a time and delve into that topic and then at the end of a period of time so they do a series on a set of topics and at the end of that pull them all together into one cohesive thought. That's about the only way I know to do it so that's the way I'm going to do it. I'm going to start at the beginning and work my way to the now. So um, by beginning I mean the creation of the universe and start my way through. I'm going to go through uh, Genesis I'm going to go through evolution. 
I'm going to go through science of all kinds, philosophy, physics, math, history, biology, all of the OGs. I'm going to go through war. I'm going to answer questions like, is the world flat? Or is the world 6,000 years old or millions of years old? I'm going to answer questions like, who's the Antichrist and what's the mark of the beast? Are those things real? Is that truth? Or are they just things that have been told to me to keep me out of the woods at night? I'm going to answer that question too. If the things in the Bible are true, then it would behoove everyone to know pretty much a good understanding of what's in it. Because if they don't know, and those things are true, they've made a very big mistake. And that happens. That's going to happen. So, it's not my job to preach. So I'm not going to preach. I'm going to attack this from a historical point of view. I'm going to answer whether these things happened or not. Whether or not they're true is up to you to decide. I'm just going to tell you what is most likely. Now, in the court of law, you have to have three witnesses to corroborate a story that you have no other way of, of proving. So those three witnesses prove that this thing is true in the eyes of the law. So it works much the same way in historical documents. You have what's called a um, primary document and a secondary and tertiary document. Those are documents that are written about documents that are written about other documents. It's like third-hand knowledge. There's very few primary documents left from that era in time, but there are enough secondary documents written, like say in uh, Corinthians, there were a bunch of priests who were writing letters back and forth to each other, and they were discussing the Bible. When they had access to the original text, we do not. So they would ask questions amongst themselves, and they would write letters back and forth, and we can cover all but 11 books of the Bible just in those letters alone. I mean, word for word, verbatim, every book of the Bible except for 11 of them. Then we had discoveries like the Dead Sea Scrolls, which covered the rest of them. And uh, so what I'm telling you is, is that we have a book that has been here for thousands of years, and it is as accurate today word for word as it possibly can be considering that it's traversed thousands of years and every piece of information that's relevant is still in it so how do I know that that's a book I can count on well two reasons number one somewhere in your life you have to learn to trust something if you don't trust something you'll not believe anything you'll be atheist which means you're stupid you don't have a belief in anything very few people are actually atheists. They have no belief in anything, which is retarded. You have Even Masons have to have a higher power. They don't care which one. They just, you can't be a real man unless you have some form of humility and you know that there's a higher power. So, there's that. So you have to trust something eventually. <laughs> in the Bible... God promises that he will always, throughout history, always keep a inspired word of God that everyone has access to. From the moment it was completed till the moment he comes back, if that happens, there will be an inspired word of God on this earth. Meaning that men wrote it inspired by God. That means that they are men and they write like men do. And that means there's probably different perspectives and things like that but it is inspired by God now how do I know this is it uh, well you can trace it back to the beginning there are basically three lines of translatable material there's lots of others but basically the major ones there are three there's the Vulgate there's the uh, Latin one the German one and then there's the King James one I can't remember the names of them all right off the top of my head. One of them is the Vulgate, and one of them is King James, whatever. Those are the three major ones, and they've been translated the most. 
and you can trace their lineage back to what's called the Septuagint, which is the original scriptures of the first part of the Bible. And you've got the uh, interlinear inner lexicon, which is a group of texts that are copies of copies of copies of copies. But they're all compiled together in this lexicon where you can get to them and read them pretty close to, to what was original. Nobody has access to the originals. They've long since disintegrated. They're all gone. But we have copies of copies, and those copies bear striking similarities to the earliest copies that we can find. For example, the book of Isaiah was written on a copper plate thousands of years ago and put in a little vase and hid in a mountain. And then it was found recently, like in the 40s. And when it was found, they were shocked to find that every word was identical. Not one word out of place, not one word added or taken away. It was all there. That proved a lot. And every text we find thus far is the same thing. They're all pretty close to what's in the book now. The other two lines of translations have all been proven from one way or another to have some shady dealings going on, to be some very badly translated or or uh, had some kind of political ideology involved and, uh, you know, battles going on. They're both tainted. The only one that can be traced directly back to the original text without fail, without question, is the King James Version of the Bible, the old version, not the new one, the 1611 version, which was written... It was written in Scotland, and the king had 50 of the highest scholars of the time come to his place, and they were all locked in separate rooms, and they were all given a piece, a portion of the Bible. Not the whole thing, but just a little, like a couple of books here, and a couple of books here, and a couple of books there. And they were all told to translate all of what they had, and when they were finished, to pass it to the next guy in the next room and have that guy check it. So every section of these books were translated by the highest scholars of the time and then checked 49 other times by other highest scholars of the times. And when they were done, they wrote a letter, which used to, you could find this letter was in the book, in the first page. It, they don't have it anymore, but I've got an original 1611 Bible that actually has the letter still in it, where they say, hey, we're humans, language changes, check our work you know we did the best we could but you know take what we did as a grain of salt and check it for yourself that's why we have things like uh, uh, shoot I'm drawing a blank what's the book there's a book that you can get uh, Strong's Concordance you can get a concordance of some kind and you can check the meanings of words and check it against what you know to be true in life and you can check it against original text and things like that which is what I spent 10 years doing going through everything I could find that question that that confused me about the Bible and retranslating it for myself and seeing what it meant on every level so that's what I did and that's why I have a good grasp on what I'm talking about so when I say that the King James is the most trustworthy version of the Bible, you can bet on that. You can check it out for yourself if you like. I urge you not to listen to anything any man says, including me, but to find out for yourself because there's a large difference between knowing something because you learned it and knowing something because you learned it yourself. You can hear somebody say something or you can go find out the knowledge for yourself. Those two things are not the same thing. I know a lot of things that I didn't physically go learn. But the things that I did physically go learn are the things that matter, like the Bible and like English. You can't tell it to hear me talk because I'm a stuttering fool and I got laryngitis, but I actually do have a degree in English and I can write very well. Can't talk worth a shit, but I can write very well. All right. Why do I have an authority on speaking to you about this or anybody who listens? because I spent 30 years doing it. I have the equivalent of a PhD. No, you can't see it because it doesn't matter. And I don't care either way. 
I also went to college. I also went to trade school. And I never let school get in the way of my education, as Mark Twain said. And I spent the rest of my life diving deeper and deeper to learn these things because I have always felt led to do what I'm doing. It's not something I wanted to do. This is not my idea, in case you can't tell. That's why I'm being a little cagey about it. <laughs> but I feel led to do so. And I figured while the podcast is small and there's only less than 12 people watching me at any point in time, I'll start talking about this stuff. And if it's meant to be, if, if somebody is supposed to listen to me, then this podcast will grow exponentially and the money will be there without question to help me pay my bills and that way I can focus on doing this full time. If that's what I'm supposed to do, then I can scratch that itch and I don't have to feel led anymore. I'll be doing it. I'll be doing my job. So if it's not meant to be, I plan to do this podcast for one year, three times a week. At the end of that year, if it is not obvious that something is doing right, that something's going right and that I'm supposed to be doing this, the money's rolling in and the people are rolling in and we got you know a couple million viewers or whatever if it ain't like that then I'll just stop I won't bitch about it I won't cause any scene I'll just stop and I ain't gonna disappear I'll still be around in some capacity but this will stop however if the opposite is true and uh, the Lord opens up all the doors for me and, and makes this thing happen then I'm gonna keep doing it and I'm gonna get better and better and better I'll start doing graphics like this. I'll do more of that stuff. And I will delve into deeper subjects. And I will take requests on subjects. If somebody has something they really want to know about but can't find any information on. I don't have a life. That's my job is to find out information. So ask away. I'll be glad to do it for you for free. Maybe somebody else can benefit from the knowledge you seek. That's the beautiful thing about having a podcast. The last thing is, uh, I've been playing music my whole life. And my whole life, I've been torn between two worlds. And then I heard somebody say one time, to find what you love and do it, and you'll never work a day in your life. Then I started watching people like Joe Rogan's podcast and uh, Anthony Cumia and Tom Green and guys like that. And I realized that that's what they did. They just took two, two or three things that they loved and smushed it together and made something out of it. So that's what I'm going to try to do. I'm going to take music and theory and shove it together and see if I can't make a career out of it. You guys be there with me and help me get there. Come along with me on the journey. How about that? We might be able to do something good. All right, starting Wednesday, I will have a written, prepared segment with footnotes and graphics. And it won't be so stuttery. I will have practiced up and made it right. And we will get some real information. We're going to talk about the Big Bang. We're going to talk about where the world came from. We're going to talk about how it got here and what this means and if this is true it's not and I'll prove it starting Wednesday uh, the Big Bang is an excuse for there to not be a God that's the whole reason the Big Bang was invented is to get away from God and it was followed by evolution and if you look up there two of those things are not like the other three Evolution is a big joke, and I'm going to prove that too, beyond a shadow of a doubt. Here's one little way you can prove it. I have looked everywhere, and I cannot find this. I went, a year before my mother died, I went to the Smithsonian with her. We, me and the kids and her went there. We went to D.C., and we went everywhere, but the Smithsonian was one of them. <laughs> and when we walked in, the first thing I saw was Lucy. Do you know who Lucy is? Lucy is the Australopithecus that they found what they did is they found a skull cap and a finger bone and then six miles away from that they found a few more fragments and they ended up with this this is Lucy's skeleton 
Now, when I walked in, notice what's missing from this skeleton, too, by the way. But look at it closely. Look at it. Look at it. Look at it. It's missing some stuff. When I went to the Smithsonian, the first thing I saw when I walked in the door was a statue of Lucy standing there by a fire holding a spear and looking off into the distance like she was watching the buffalo's herd. And beside her was her small child. And beside her small child was her larger man. And they were just standing there like they had just come out of the lean-to and they were looking out across the... And the first thing I noticed about them is that they had feet and hands. And I looked at my children and I said, you see this, children? This statue is propaganda. This is what I'm talking about when I tell you that the things you're being taught are not real. Look at what they found. This is it. This is the, the thing they found. They found it, incidentally, one week before their grant money ran out, and they needed to re-up for more grant money to keep looking for other things. And this is the case almost every time. If you'll go do some research, you'll find out that the Piltdown Man, that the Australopithecus, the Cro-Magnon, the Neanderthal, the... Uh, 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 I can't remember their names now, Mississippi Man, whoever it was. You know who I'm talking about. All of those things are all fake. And I showed it to my kids. I said, you see these bones? And they had a little plaque with the bones on it beside the statue. I said, what do you notice about this that you don't see here? And they said, my 10-year-old child said, they don't have any feet. I said, that's right. Do you know why they don't have any feet? She said, because that's a monkey. I said, you're absolutely right. That is the bones of a monkey. And this is not made from the bones of a monkey. This is an artist rendering. This is fake. This is propaganda. This is not what that thing looked like. First of all, I could not find a, even a picture of the statue that we saw. They've taken it down. You can't find it. I googled it for almost an hour and could not find it. This is the closest I could come. I did not see this in Smithsonian, but I'm guessing this took its place because too many people were asking questions about that little child and the spear that she was holding. The one thing you cannot tell from bones is whether or not those bones ever had any children or if they ever learned how to use tools which is what I explained to my children. And this is an artist rendering that's close to the thing that I saw. Notice the whites in the eyes. Notice the hands. And to be sure, these things have human feet. However, monkeys' feet and people's feet are not the same, not even close. They're not even built even in the same vein. The only thing that makes them similar is they have five appendages. But one of them is like a talon to climb with, not like a thumb to grasp with. If you've ever seen a chimpanzee's foot, that's what greater ape foots look like. This does not have feet or hands. It also does not have a complete arm because these arms hang way further down to about here, if you can see my mouse pointer, which I don't know if you can or not, but they hang down a lot further than these arms go. There's no brow ridge, if you'll notice. There's no upper teeth. There's no completed pelvis. It, and the pelvis that's here is broken. Some of the ribs are missing. The hands and feet are missing. <laughs> Why is that? Because this is a monkey that they're trying to pass off as a human being. And this is not what that thing looks like. This guy is responsible for that. You ever notice that when you look at a textbook or a TV show on History Channel or whatever, and they'll show you something like this. I 
all this gray matter here are parts of the bone that they did not find. The more gray you see, the less of the actual skeleton is there. This is a reconstruction of little pieces that were found. And they probably shoved this jawbone in there to make it fit, and it might not even belong to this skeleton. But if you've ever noticed, when they come up with something like that, the very next thing they do is hire an artist to come in, and then they make something like... that based on that skeleton you ever notice that it's always monkey like but always kind of man like too they got white sclera they got sharp pupils and they have vegetable eating teeth and they have whiskers not hair I submit that it could also look like that. Two can play at that game, Darwin. This guy is this guy. This guy is this guy. This guy is probably more closely to what an old human being would look like. You'll also notice that they have names for things that blow people away, like Australopithecus and Piltdown Man, Neanderthal, and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, do you know what a Neanderthal is? A Neanderthal is a bone that was found in the Neander Valley. Anything that's found in Neander Valley is called a Neanderthal. This is a Neanderthal. They always make it look like this guy, though. I say he looks like this. The reason I say that is because I know what a Neanderthal is. A Neanderthal is a humanoid who has thicker bones, thicker joints, a bigger brow ridge, a larger nose, a larger jaw, and is denser than a normal human being. And they think that that means that it must be some kind of greater ape that was built way different than us. And I say no. What a Neanderthal is, is a human being that lived longer than a hundred years. That's all it is. If you know anything about the anatomy, you know that when you reach about 20 years old, you stop growing. What you may or may not know is that your brow and your jaw never stop growing ever. Ever. To the day you die, it keeps growing. That's why old men end up looking like this guy. See the brow? He didn't look like that in his younger years. But this guy... This guy is a man who lived eight or nine hundred years, or six or seven hundred years, or three or four hundred years. The older they get, the thicker they get, and the more healthy they are. Because this guy lived before the flood, which I'll prove to you. And the flood changed the world, changed it drastically. It changed the oxygen, the atmosphere. I'll prove that to you also. I'll show you how it happened. I'll show you where it happened. I'll show you direct evidence that it did happen. Not fairy tales, not stories, direct evidence. This guy is probably... This guy. Hmm? Take a good look. Oh, yeah. That's what a Neanderthal looks like that lives long enough to look like this. Then you have these guys. Pow! Look at that. That's strange. Well, what is that? This is a guy who lived way longer than this guy. That's all. They've done DNA tests on these things. These were found in Peru. 
and they toiled around for several years, about 25 years, they hopped back and forth between owners. And finally, somebody did a DNA test on them, and what they discovered were these things were European in descent. What? I thought they were aliens. That's what the TV tells you, that they're aliens. They're not aliens. They're people. Look, they are weird people. They got some traits that we don't have, but they are people. And I submit that these are people that lived in the 900-year range. And this is what happens to the head when it's around for 900 years. This... This is a chart. This chart says that Adam lived 800 years. No, 930 years. And his son lived 912 years. And you can look at this chart. You can zoom in on it and save it. And get close to it and read it. This is the approximate age, according to the Bible, of all of these characters, which are all one family, from Adam to Joseph. And Joseph... Through him came the family that would spawn Jesus Christ. So that's another thing I want to prove about the Bible is that the whole thing is about one family and how life weaves in and out. So you can see where I'm headed. You can see the kind of things that I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to get better at it. I'm going to get more in depth and I'm going to show more graphics. I have to collect all the graphics and find ones that aren't, uh, you know, copyrighted and stuff like that. So it's going to take me a little time. That's why I'm not just blowing out of the gate with all this stuff. This is literally happening in real time. The research is happening. So you know that you're getting true information. I may not be correct, but I promise you I'm not lying to you. Everything I tell you will be as true as I can prove it to be from the best sources that I can find with a non-biased approach. So with that, I bid you adieu, and I will see you on Wednesday, Worldly Wednesday. Thank you guys for hanging out with me. Please like, subscribe, and share paypal.me slash jakejohnsonband or follow one of the links in the description below to buy a t-shirt or whatever, and we'll see you Wednesday. Thanks, guys.